Welcome to the Simpleton Podcast. My name's Clark Massey. I'm here with Laura Heeman. Hey, Clark. I'm in. Hi, hi, Laura. <laughs> I'm in. I'm in Kansas City, Missouri. Laura's in Maryland, at, actually. In Maryland, I, yeah. <laughs> but lives in D.C. And we are finally tackling something we wanted to tackle, which is doing a multi-part series on the sex abuse crisis in the Catholic Church, and we're starting it with um, the Cardinal McCarrick report that was put out in the fall of 2020. And both Laura and I had multiple interactions with Cardinal McCarrick over his mm-hmm. tenure. He was like, Simple House was founded while he was Cardinal in Washington, D.C. And I went to a Catholic high school uh, in the Archdiocese of Washington, D.C. while he was there. Yep. Right. Mm-hmm. And this report is enormous. It's focused on, it's 400 plus pages and over 1400 footnotes. And a lot of the footnotes are worth reading. They're kind of interesting. And the focus of the report is not so much putting McCarrick on trial. It's kind of like putting the church on trial on how they, it was a big review of how the church handled McCarrick and how he was allowed to advance uh, based on what they knew and different issues like that. Is that pretty accurate? Right. Yeah. Mm Mm-hmm. And as we talk about this, the scandals, um, we're going to use the terms abuse and the term harassment. The term abuse is going to be for anyone who's underage who was sexually abused, you know. Mm-hmm. And within abuse, there's pedophilia. There's another term called like hebophilia for people in puberty. There's even another term for people who are between 15 and 19 years old, still not of age, called like ephebophilia. I don't know if I've ever heard anyone say that out loud before, just read it. And I don't think we're going to worry about these terms that much because they're, they're clinically relevant or people argue that they're clinically relevant, but they're not that legally relevant. And I don't think they're that relevant for our main concern, which is how do we prevent abuse? You know, mm-hmm. I think, I think almost all of our strategies are going to apply to all three. Mm-hmm. Right. And then harassment would be a separate category where, you're somehow leveraging your position of power on an adult mm-hmm. for some for some sexual predatory reason. Yeah, I mean, it doesn't have to be exactly predatory at the broad range, but... I wanted to limit it to predatory because I think there's also the case where there's just been people who have been, not been chased, you know? Right. And you could you could say that like whenever a priest is not chased at any level, maybe he's always got some power over whoever he's being not chased with. But I don't think that's sure. true because I think we've seen I've I've known women who like target priests, yep. you know, and I've seen examples of that. And I think there's also this kind of the thing that's not not evil, but there, there are girls who seem to run after seminarians. Right, right, right. right. <laughs> There's even seminary a name for Mary these. Is, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Chalice Tripper and Seminary Mary is the name for that. And yeah. uh, most of them aren't doing anything evil if they're kind of doing the church a favor. Because if the guy leaves seminary for one of the girls who's chasing him, probably that's for right. the best. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so another term that I can't define, even though I tried to do some research on it, was the term credible accusation. Mm-hmm. I don't. It seems to be that credible accusation is kind of what you want it to be. Like it's, it definitely means the accusation is possible. Like if someone said it happened on this date, well, then you could like look at travel schedules and see if it, that was even possible, you know? So yeah. credible accusation appears to be a very loose term. It means it's possible and it's possibly believable. It's not even close to what the U.S. government would use in a court of law. Right, right. You know? Right. It's but not a I, presumption I think for of the, innocence or anything. Yeah, like um, a victim coming forward or a, a direct witness probably are things like you would think of as a credible accusation, right? And so sometimes rumors are flying, but you don't have a victim. <laughs> right. Uh, and what do you do with that? That's interesting because that, that directly yeah. relates to McCarrick for a lot mm-hmm. of his tenure was yep. – yeah. Lots of rumors, lots of accusations, but no witnesses that wanted right. to come forward. Uh, that That's not perfect. There were that's witnesses not, yeah, who came right. forward. We'll get into yeah, 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 it. Yeah. Right. We'll get into the exact measure of that. So, okay, yeah. so to signpost this a little bit, yeah, we'll, we're finishing up with this, and then we'll go into our interactions with McCarrick, and then we'll go over the evidence and the report. I'm going to summarize the evidence of him abusing people who are not in the church, meaning like not mm-hmm. seminarians and priests, but then mm-hmm. there's also a lot of evidence. Laura's going to summarize that you're going to do that's basically just his, the accusations of what he did to mm-hmm. priests. 
right? right? And seminarians. Okay. The only other thing I wanted to mention was like through Simple House, I have worked with a lot of criminals. I've worked with a lot of people who were abused. I've worked with a lot of people who were abusers. And I really, I can't watch TV shows anymore that my dad calls cop operas <laughs> that are just like criminal shows that are meant for entertainment because like I've known too many criminals and the way it's sensationalized or done for you know, like your viewing pleasure is just not right. And it's, it's not really leading you to understand reality better. And it's also, mm-hmm. it's, I don't know if the right word is pornographic, but there's something about it. That's like just kind of playing on our desire to. Yeah. Voyeur. Sensationalism. Maybe. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, so anyway, we're going to try to not do that. Um, but we're going to take all this as seriously as possible. All right. Before we get into our interactions, let's talk about some theories that you and I have discussed that I think are going to be in a lot of Catholics' minds while they listen to this. One theory is, is this abuse somehow linked to theology? Like, are liberal theological people more likely to do abuse or certain types of abuse or harassment? And mm-hmm. are conservatives more likely to do certain types of abuse or harassment? And I think... Most people suspect, yes, one side or the other. <laughs> right. Yeah. And I think you and I have discussed that at length, and I, we want you to draw your own conclusions. We'll give you all the evidence we have on it. Mm-hmm. Definitely both sides have been convicted of very serious things. Right. You know, the other question is, is this just homosexuality gone wrong? You know what I mean? Or is this real pedophilia? Is a question through a lot of people's minds, like a lot of the preying and sexual harassment stuff on adults could be like predatory homosexuality. I, I think it would be easy for some people to just like pin this on homosexuality uh, if they are of a sort of certain mindset, and that is obviously wrong. They're supposed to be part of the formation process for priests is that homosexually oriented men are not supposed to become priests. I, I don't remember yeah. what the canon law is or what, but that's like part of one of the things that's supposed to withhold someone from the priesthood. I, I don't remember Having if said there that, is canon law on that, but there was like something came out when I was in college about that in response to the 2001 Okay, we should crisis. see. I thought that was an older idea or teaching than that, but we should look okay. into that. Certainly there are okay. a lot of people, a lot of seminaries where that was not enforced. Okay, I, I know there was in, you know, 2002 or three, this document came out that created a lot of buzz about could a homosexual person become a priest? Could a homosexual man become a priest, even if he was living chastely? We'll we'll go over that, I guess, when we do the Mm -hmm. Boston Globe and the reaction to Mm -hmm. the Boston Globe uh, Mm -hmm. articles in the early 2000s. Um, The other question I think Catholics are wondering all the time is, can you intuitively read this? You know, I mean, like, are you are you going to be someone who can walk up and identify a predator? Right. You know, um, we're going to go the case of one woman with McCarrick who did identify him and was kind of on an island identifying him. Mm-hmm. Um, and she kind of gives pretty good evidence that probably we all think we could identify him if we saw what she saw. But um, uh, clearly people did not have as much courage as she did. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think this intu- intuition thing is a dangerous theory, but it's a valid theory that needs to be considered. It's dangerous, though, because like also through our work with Simple House, there's a lot of concern about sex trafficking. Right. And you'll see these posters say, be on the lookout for someone who doesn't want to talk or be on the lookout for right. someone who won't make eye contact. And it's like, what am I going to do? <laughs> Call 911 yeah. and say so and so is not making eye contact. You know, I mean, yeah. we need like bigger grounds for accusing people than our intuition mm-hmm. and then these subtle mm-hmm. signs. You know, right. I mean, it's not right to just be accusing people based on small things, you know. Right. Um, there should be some presumption of innocence, even if we're not the U.S. government in a court of law. Yeah. And I mean, some people, you know, you hear about cases where people like, you know, the stewardess noticed there was something strange and she calls the police and she was right. You know, and some people have some people have good intuition and some people have bad intuition. <laughs> and well, that's a difficult thing. I heard a case where they did a study on whether or not cops could tell whether or not someone was armed, a suspect was armed. Mm. And they would show videos of different suspects and let the cops watch it. And then they'd at the end say, was this guy armed or not armed? Right. And what they found was a very large fraction of cops said they could tell, Mm -hmm. said they had good intuition. 
mm-hmm. a very small fraction of cops could tell. Wow. And then of that small fraction, but there were some that could tell regularly. There, apparently, there were some that could look at people's body movements and stuff and read whether or not they were armed. But then of that small section, they tried to get that section to hold classes to teach other people how to identify yeah. it, and it completely failed. Wow. So apparently, the intuition, I think that could be true here for sexual predators, where it's like mm-hmm. more people think they can tell than can tell. Of the people who can tell, that's not much of a solution because they can't educate all of us or prove it. <laughs> so, all right. Well, let's get into our experience with Cardinal McCarrick. Mm-hmm. My first experience might have been after your experience. I think you said you mm-hmm. had an experience in high school because my first mm-hmm. experience was 9-11. Were you in high school during 9-11? That or was were you my already freshman year of college. Mm-hmm. Okay. So tell your high school experience. So, well, I will say one thing is like people loved him. Everyone liked him. And he was so, very charming. Um, he was very charming. And it was great to hear him speak. And he would write stuff in like the Catholic newspaper that people love to read. Um, but I one time. So this would have been like late in high school, because at this point I had thought like maybe I would be a nun, whatever. I just like wanted to give myself like fully to the church. And I was with I don't know if it was like a pro-life rally or something like that. And I was uh, with a male friend and had the opportunity to meet Cardinal McCarrick. And so he approaches my male friend and is uh, saying like, thank you so much for being here. It's so wonderful that you're here. Have you ever thought about giving yourself to the church as one of her priests? And, you know, all this very long interaction and it's very nice. And I'm kind of like waiting very excitedly for him to ask me, you know, what, whatever. And then he just sort of shakes my hand and barely says a word. And I was like, oh, you know, and on to the next person. And I was like, oh, I guess like being a priest is more important or something like it's sort of like, and you know, it hurt my feelings a little bit. I had to check myself as like, it's okay. It's okay. You know, but th- there was a line in the report where, you know, this mom observed that he had like no interest in girls and, uh, and a weird interest in, in boys. And this just flashed in my mind when I read that. So yeah, th- th- I guess that was like kind of the first interaction that I would say was of note. And then after that would have been nine eleven. And where and, did you see him at the Basilica or? Well, that's nine eleven really s- stuck out to me because DC was a crazy place to be for 9-11. Like, yeah. there was a lot of uncertainty about like what was going to happen. Was there an invading army coming? Like, we had machine gun yeah. nests on Pennsylvania Avenue near my offices mm-hmm. where I worked. It was just like the city got military real quick, you know. And I remember George Bush on 9-11. I've had to check to make sure this memory is correct because it's, it's a very clear memory for me, but it's so crazy sounding. Uh, on the day of 9-11, George Bush addressed the nation and basically said, we are going to fix this and we are calling our operation Infinite Justice. Did you? Is that true? Did That's you say true. That? That's true. And I, I got it confirmed by an internet source that I heard that right. Because when he said that, I was like, oh, no. I felt like that yeah. was like calling your military operation final judgment. Like we are yeah. going to launch Armageddon <laughs> on you guys, you know? Oy. And um, I, you already know that it was very a religiously motivated attack, and I was kind of aware of what Islamic fundamentalism was before 9-11, so I kind of knew that was a threat. And when George Bush said that, I thought, oh, no, you know? Yeah. And so that day also what was happening was I think they were televising with C-SPAN the um, National Cathedral, which is not Catholic, it's Anglican, or mm-hmm. Episcopalian, rather. And um, all these different religious leaders are going to the National Cathedral and speaking, including McCarrick. And, you know, I didn't listen to everyone's speech, but I was really worried that there was going to be calls for blood. Um, I mean, not that there shouldn't have been a military reaction. I'm not trying to say that one way or another. I'm just saying you do not want to launch nukes right after the World Trade Center's fall. You know what I mean? And um, McCarrick stood up and did not try to summarize the moment. Instead, he just read the Beatitudes. Mm. Blessed be the meek, blessed be the poor. Mm. And I thought that was great leadership, and it struck me that was great leadership because it was like, look, no one knows what's going on. Yeah. Look at some fundamental truths, calm down, mm-hmm. and yeah. let's like sleep on it <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> or something, you know? Yeah. And yeah. so I thought that was great leadership. 
And then I don't remember really seeing him again until the first sex abuse crisis started breaking with the Boston Globe. So was that, that was after 9-11, but like yeah. same. So 9-11 was 2001 and the Boston Globe article started coming out in early 2002. So there's not much time between those two events, I guess, just a few months, mm -hmm. right? And when the Boston Globe articles came out, I took them extremely seriously and was very upset. And in hindsight, I think a lot of people did not take them that seriously, uh, at least young people, because I, I've noticed that some of my friends, when some more Christ, you know, abuse articles came out, I was like, well, why are you surprised by this? I mean, we kind of knew this yeah. stuff was happening and we kind of knew there were scandals in every diocese, even though Boston mm -hmm. was the one hung out to dry on it, you know? Mm -hmm. um, why are you even scandalized? And it was clear to me that they just had not... Um, Processed. Yeah, they hadn't like really dealt with it when it happened in 2001, right? Yeah. I, I do remember having a feeling rather. of, right, of, you know, I um, have this kind of new energy. I'm like growing in the faith. And then this like thing is coming out and it's not congruent with what I'm experiencing and what I'm seeing in the church. And it, you know, just wanting to put my head in the sand, right? <laughs> um I, that sounds and right. I, I think actually putting your head in the sand like could be an appropriate reaction if you're sort of at a spiritually sensitive moment or something. Sure. Um, as long as you come to terms later, you can't be in denial yes, no, of it forever. No, that's right. That's right. You know? Yeah. But I do think there's like mm -hmm. a sense in which I wasn't too far from that moment either of just having this mm -hmm. unbelievable, you know, kind of Catholic enlightenment of like, wow, this is really well thought out. Look at this theology. <laughs> yeah. This makes so much sense. You know, I'm seeing so many answers here. And then like mm -hmm. the Boston articles are coming out and you're like what you know yeah and really it took i feel like i today know so much more about how to organize an organization so that it runs mm -hmm. well and so that you don't have people abusing power and so you don't have like little corruptions and things like this than i did when i was 21 you know right. what i mean like i don't know right. if that like when i was that age i even had a way of really processing well what yeah. it meant to need a systemic reform you know right. so early 2002 boston globe comes out and there was a series of talks called Theology on Tap Talks. Which still um, goes on today. Yeah. Still goes on today. And they're often in DC area, they were often like these nice Irish pubs, mm -hmm. right? And McCarrick's Irish. And um, he was scheduled for a Theology on Tap Talk. Just so happens the Boston Globe articles are coming out and he's going to give this talk. And I wanted to go hear what he was going to say about it, kind of like he was going to mm -hmm. address the faithful, you know? Mm -hmm. But when I arrive, for this talk in the Irish pub, there's news crews outside. Um, there aren't that, I mean, there's like, I got to get inside, but there wasn't enough room for the young people who wanted to go to Theology on Tap because the news mm -hmm. crews actually had cameras set up to film it, you know, mm -hmm. and they wanted to ask me carrot questions about what had happened. And because I was kind of mad because I had ideas about why did this happen, how we needed to correct it, how it was a problem that the bishop in Boston or the cardinal in Boston had shifted abusers around and like all these things needed mm -hmm. addressed. And McCarrick's answer to the problem, which is so ironic that he wasn't accused at this moment that we didn't know, his answer to the problem was, look, it looks like 2% of the population, 2% of men suffer from pedophilia, you know, the attraction, not the mm -hmm. act, but... And if you, and he's like, and if you look at the priesthood, it looks like about 2% suffer from pedophilia. And he goes, this isn't caused by celibacy. It just looks like we have the same percentage as everybody else. And I walked out of there kind of mad because I'm like, we well, should have a, <laughs> if you're creating an institution that's supposed to be a high bar for morality, in the right. very least, you should have lower than the national average right, on pedophilia. Right, right, right. You know? um, yeah. But he, he was saying this, and I remember non-Catholic friends asking me about the crisis, and I was taking my cues from McCarrick, you know? Okay. I was repeating these things that he was saying uh, about that, you know, like it's not a worse problem in the Catholic Church than it is in other institutions. I do think that could be true. Like. I, I think that, I mean, this is kind of a conclusion that we need to work on as we review all the evidence, but to me, institutions have abuse problems. Yeah. Be they public schools, be they mental asylums, be yes, they, absolutely. you know, yeah. orphanages, yeah. whatever. And it doesn't matter if they're Catholic or not, you need to get those institutions right, or you will have predators in those institutions and big yep. abuse problems, right? Yep, yep. Um, and the Catholic Church, I think, had some special dynamics, because it's not like all those institutions have clericalism or all those institutions have like right. the different things that are peculiarly Catholic. Mm -hmm. But um, I think the Catholic church has been hung out to dry a little bit on this. And I, I have a friend who his job is to sue people for sexual abuse. 
and he says, you know, they sue public schools all the time. Yeah. You know, and yeah. I, there's clearly not the level of media attention, and I don't really care. Yeah. I'm not trying to create media attention on that. I want yeah. the Catholic Church fixed, and I want the public schools fixed, but we are supposed to be held to a higher standard, so— yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah. So I was pretty crestfallen I think another, after that. Another common point at the time was that it was mainly in the past, which I, I do think that is to some extent true. There was more abuse in the past, right? But It wasn't that far in the past for McCarrick. It was not that far in the past. <laughs> yeah, but I, I yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So during this time, we also started meeting people who worked at the archdiocese because we were starting Simple House. and. Mm -hmm. Very impressed with some of the employees at the archdiocese, very unimpressed yeah. with other employees at the archdiocese, not that they were abusive or anything like that, but it just seemed like it wasn't clear what their agenda was. You know, yeah. I I did not think that was a McCarrick problem. Like the people I was impressed with, McCarrick had brought in, right? you know, and yeah. a lot of the other people maybe were legacy people, mm -hmm. but that seemed to be like nationwide. Like there was kind of a problem of people working in the Catholic church as career employees who mm -hmm. weren't necessarily rowing with the team, in my opinion, you know, yeah. like didn't mm -hmm. necessarily believe in the yeah. catechism and had problems. So I, sure. I wouldn't blame McCarrick for not cleaning house because it was very rare to see bishops clean house of employees, you know? Yeah. Um, I do think that Whirl cleaned house in DC. Yes, he did. And, yeah. And I think yeah. he used the 2008 uh, recession as an excuse to lay off a lot of people who weren't my source says he used that as a way to take mm -hmm. people out of the diocese who weren't ideologically aligned with Catholicism. Right. right. That's a weird way of saying that. But believers in Catholicism fully. It was the people that were left were more of one mind. Right. Right. Yeah. And on a pretty good page. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm not too critical of it. Yeah. But I, I think it's important to say that while he was in the diocese, there were definitely people working in the office that, that we think were like good. Great. Even wonderful people, yeah. holy people, you know, it, it wasn't like full of <laughs> corrupt yeah. people protecting him or and something. Yeah. We have to talk about church politics a little bit with this because it is mm -hmm. part of it. You know, in a way, though, I want to say that I go out of my way not to be partisan within the church. And right. yeah. I just want people to more or less uh, believe in the core beliefs like the catechism and then be as different as they want to be. You mm -hmm. know, as long as we have mm -hmm. that in common, I'm not trying to say, you know, the church needs to have this attitude towards the Latin mass or this attitude towards this devotion. I'm just like, just yeah. believe in the catechism and then, diff you mm -hmm. know, differing opinions are welcome, you know. Right. So also during this period, he would always mention vocations every single talk. I don't think that's a bad thing, although it's weird coming from a guy who abuses vocations. Mm -hmm. And he also became a donor of Simple House. He wrote it mm -hmm. from his personal account. Mm -hmm. Um, that made us feel pretty special. He still donated up until recently. Yeah. He might up still until donate recently. again. And when he started donating, he was like, he, we were getting like, except for a, he, uh, like a few huge donations. It was like the amount he was donating was like, wow. Substantial. You know, a, mm -hmm. I, I believe it was about yeah. 500 bucks, maybe once or twice a year. He, he right? would give, yeah, in the hundreds. And that was like, we weren't really getting a lot of donations like that. Um, right. so it really stood out how generous, you know, that was and felt and special. In this report, it kind of put that in context for me because I was wondering, did he particularly like our ministry or what? And it, it appears that that was part of his like operating way of operating is that he gave gifts to all the Roman Curia on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. When people from Rome visited, he was paying for he would like kind of give them cash to pay for their trip. He would um, he was supporting lots of charities. It seemed he had a regular pipeline of fundraisers that were giving to his personal fund, which then he would give away. Right. And it was very personal looking. Like I can usually mm -hmm. tell when a bishop writes us a check, a couple bishops have, and it's very sweet, you know, when yeah. they do. And, um, but anyway, it looked very personal. I'm not sure it was personal. I think he was just very good at it too, like yeah. doing large yeah. numbers of donations. Mm -hmm. So I feel like there was something happening where it was like, don't cardinals have to put in an automatic offer to resign at like 75 or something like that? I think they are supposed to. I think that a thing that comes out in this document was that they, <laughs> Rome wanted him really to put in this, uh, <laughs> put in this resignation. I don't know how it works retire. exactly, but yeah. it was like, you're going to resign now and conveniently you're of the right age. But a bishop in his 70s would put in a resignation and that wouldn't be 
abnormal. That's not like, oh, something must yeah. have happened, just to clarify. I remember the buzz on the street was along the lines of, the buzz I was hearing was not anything to do with church sex scandal. It was had mm-hmm. to do with, you know, he's not really an orthodox thinker. He's um, not really on the same page as Cardinal Ratzinger and they would like him out, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. Which just kind of politicized it, but a Clearly, the Vatican had bigger reasons than that to be worried. Right. Yeah. And we know priests, you know, that became priests in the diocese under him and uh, like were blindsided, blindsided by this and had had, you know, even one priest loved him uh, and he was like the main person he wanted at his first mass and all, you know, and had no idea. Like he was like one of the most important people in his like kind of coming to the church and everything. And there's like no clue. He then got moved and we knew that he was interacting with certain orders that were, in our minds, very conservative, mm-hmm. right? Like uh, the Institute of the Incarnate Word. And there also was this movement that's kind of Spanish in origin called the Neocatechumenal Way that was at our church. And they always struck me as almost a little bit aggressively conservative theologically. And he like even went to the point that he was living in a seminary run by the neocatechumenal way, which at the time, I think you and I thought this is genius. Like here we have yeah. this kind of like liberal thinker living with this like ultra conservative, uh, uh, ultra conservative is too strong. I, word. I, I don't want to call group. the neocats, the neocatechumenal. I don't know if ultra conservative is right. I, and I, I've had positive experiences with them, but yeah, but they were more conservative. But yeah, so we thought it was like a brilliant move. Yeah, because we want that type of diversity of thought interacting and moderating yeah, each other. And moderating. Like this. Right. Um, in hindsight, that was a terrible move. The first time I knew something was up was we were getting our book together um, of Simple House Letters from the founding, and we thought we could get a really cool introduction written by someone who was kind of high up in the church, and we thought Mm -hmm. McCarrick could write it, Mm -hmm. and we thought, or we thought Whirl could write it, because McCarrick was already retired at this point, Mm -hmm. and I kind of knew that people were bothered by McCarrick, and I didn't want to like alienate people with this introduction. So I kind of was, I decided, hey, I'm going to go online and look for, you know, people like, has McCarrick done anything that like would make him not be good to write this intro? And I was looking for him saying some heresy. I wasn't looking for sexual abuse information. Right. right? But like what I came across was the Father Z blog and Father Z, who I didn't never heard of until that moment, um, had written some of the accusations that are in this report about seminarians at the beach house. And I then went to my pastor, priest of our local parish, and he's he's pretty in touch. Like he's been president of the American Liturgical Society and things like this. And I go, I was thinking about having McCarrick write this, and I saw this crazy stuff online on Father Z's blog. And the priest looked at me and he goes, well, let me look into it. Give me a day. He goes, Father Z has an agenda, but he's not a liar. He then came back the next day and he says, if you never want anything to come out about the person who writes your introduction, don't ask McCarrick. Right. And that like shocked me partly because we were in a new age then, like the the Boston Globe stuff was already going on, was like 10 years old, you know, when this happened. Yeah. And I just didn't think that level of problem was going to still be there. You know, did you did you think I think maybe I felt this a little bit at some point, like the stuff that was going to come into the light, you know, major, major scandal had mostly been revealed at that point. Or like I thought there was still scandals to uncover, but not like another Boston. I think what my opinion was then that's still mostly my opinion now was Mm -hmm. that every major every diocese was having Mm -hmm. problems before the Boston Globe articles before 2001. Like there was. People knew that crimes had been committed. People didn't know what to do about it. Uh, people didn't know if they should settle or if they should admit or if they should out these priests who'd done it. Right. Or, and some and a lot of them had tried to remove priests from being predators, like just get them somehow in positions that they couldn't hurt people. You know. Yeah. So they were like they were conscious that there was a problem. They were worried. Benedict Rochelle shaped my thought on this a lot because he gave a talk because he works with people with sexual dysfunctions. And he was like, you know, every bishop in the nation knew they had like this dirty laundry in the closet and was really worried about it. And it didn't mean that those bishops were even responsible for the dirty laundry. Mm -hmm. They could have completely inherited it. 
right? Yeah. And so 10 years after 2001, my sense was we'd had organizational reform Mm -hmm. uh, to make sure it wouldn't continue. We'd had better systems in place that a lot of the stuff that was bad that did happen was before 1990. And even a lot of it was pre-Vatican II, you know? And so a lot of these guys are just dead. Right. You know, I mean, like there's not much to be done, you know, like you could, you could have a lawsuit to drain the church of funds or whatever, but it's kind of historical as opposed to current, you know? Mm -hmm. And so finding out McCarrick is still has his good name is still a Cardinal and has got all these accusations that really haven't hit the press yet was shocking to me at that level. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I, I thought that like, if you wanted to, like the Pennsylvania thing didn't shock me. I haven't looked at it that deeply, which we will in the course of this, but It didn't shock me just because I just figured there was dirty laundry in every diocese. And if you want to go look at dirty laundry and be horrified, you can, you know? Yeah, 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 right, 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 yeah. (laughs) I even heard that in the Kansas City diocese that they kind of knew it was coming and even prepared for the bad news that they knew was coming, you know? But that wasn't, I don't think that made them good or bad. I think that was just kind of like... Like prepared financially? Yes. And prepared maybe PR-wise that, hey, when this hits... We're going to own it. And I think they did a good job here. They owned it. They proactively went out. They settled it. And they tried to move on. You know? So that's when I knew something was up with McCarrick. And that would have been like 2012 or 2011. Yeah, around that. I forget what year. But yeah. So yeah. And we had World write the intro to our book. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) yeah. That was a good bet. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Well, it is better than McCarrick. We can't group World and McCarrick and even Bishop in Kansas City in the same group. But um, one other thing to mention is we also were aware that McCarrick was doing a lot more than being Cardinal in D.C. Like he was, uh, I remember him saying one time that he was working for the Library of Congress. I remember mm-hmm. him saying that he had gone to Syria to negotiate some peace during that, you know, when the Syria thing was Arab Spring mm-hmm. time yeah. was happening. And it seemed like even in hindsight that he did a lot of work for the U.S. government, even like talking yeah. to China mm-hmm. as a diplomat and things. The FBI tried to like recruit him uh, as a uh, like counterintelligence for this like KGB agent. That really? Was, I, yeah. Was that in the report? I didn't read. That was in the report. That was in your yeah. part. Yeah, that was right, crazy. Good. Yeah, but he he was meeting with presidents. Um, he was part of these like important, you know, delegations that went to uh, respond to kind of sensitive political things in different countries to try to create, you know, goodwill because he was good at it, apparently. Yeah. And hypothetically, we don't know that all that was wrong. You know, I mean, no, I, I, I mean, yeah, I am ready now to actually talk about what he's accused of. All right. So let's talk about the non-seminarians, non-priests. And then we'll go for seminarians. We're not trying to give everyone brain damage with bad news and ugly things, but we're also going to try to just own it straight out what happened. Okay. Yeah. Early on in the 80s and in the 70s, he was very important in the diocese right away for fundraising. He was very notable as a person. He became a Monsignor fairly quickly, it seems. Um, And he started befriending large Catholic families. Mm -hmm. Um, He was considered kind of like a notable guest. Trying to, I was trying to figure out how a non-Catholic would understand how a prestigious cleric would be seen and because it's not quite like having Bon Jovi over or a a regular celebrity or a Kardashian it's because we all wouldn't be surprised if one of those people was super corrupt you know I right I feel like it's like having someone over who's supposed to be well-bred and like I hate the word well-bred but they're, they're they're like nobility or they're like um it'd be like having a duke like hey my friend, the Duke, you almost do <laughs> yeah. It's kind of an impressive friend to have, you know, even though Dukes don't do right. anything these days. So there's some sense in which he ingratiated himself using this mm-hmm. kind of cachet he had. He also started creating vacations and parties and fishing trips and things like this, where he would take the young men of the family on these trips. Mm-hmm. And the person who's most interesting from this period is a person in the report identified as Mother One. There's Mother One and Father One. So they're of the One family. And Mother One got skeezed out and realized something was wrong. She realized he was too interested in the boys. Mm-hmm. Uh, she walked in and saw his like hand on her son's thighs making mm-hmm. movements, you know, while they're just mm-hmm. sitting on the couch, you know, not even mm-hmm. really hiding it, you know saw him like be too possessive of the young men, saw him touch them in ways that didn't seem natural to her um, or appropriate, but not 
anything you'd go to jail for. Okay, like nothing that you could like say was definitively sexual abuse, but it was either grooming or it was just. And then she also found out that when they'd gone on trips with him, they'd had alcohol, even though they weren't Mm -hmm. of age. And she had never given them alcohol in their whole life. So it had been their first time to have alcohol. Mm -hmm. And um, she knew that was to lower their inhibitions. And father one was unconvinced as if he was blinded, Mm -hmm. you know, by it. He was like dazzled. He was dazzled. You also got to think he's like, show me hard evidence. Have one Mm -hmm. of the boys tell me something bad happened. But if it's just all this like, skeezy stuff i'm gonna think better of him than that you know right but she's like no this is skeezy yeah right yeah and she then took it into her own hands and it appears that she was quite scared it's kind of unclear of what but i think i would have been scared too even though i wouldn't have known of what and she goes and she has a whole day she sits at the library and hand writes anonymous letters and sends them to the papal nuncio and all the cardinals in the church, it appears. I think that happened. And her sons thought that happened. Their sons said years later, yeah, she told us after she didn't tell anyone while she was doing it. But like a year later, she's like, look, I wrote everybody. I told him that this is, they need to keep an eye on this guy, you know? And the sons all remember her saying that and were interviewed by the Vatican for this report, but none of those letters have ever been discovered, Mm -hmm. you know? And that would make me think they could have easily been destroyed but they were sent different places. But there was also this issue that all the other anonymous letters, we have a lot of anonymous letters written about Cardinal McCarrick that come later, but we just don't have hers. So that's mm-hmm. kind of weird. But I, I do, it does seem like she really did it. And she tried to just warn everyone that this is super c- creepy, but she had no clear abuse to mm-hmm. accuse him of. And her sons, my understanding to this day, have never said that they were abused. They, I don't know if, if they were or not, I'm just saying they haven't claimed it. They just were like, yeah, it was creepy. We didn't think anything of it. It was already, by the time the letters were written and everything, we were already not really hanging out with Cardinal, with uh, McCarrick. Yeah. And an, an interesting thing one of the sons said, um, which is later repeated, uh, is that they didn't, um, they thought his behavior was like uncomfortable and strange, but they didn't perceive it as sexual. Right necessarily and i actually think if we were looking for ways to identify abusers and to kind of intuit what's happening i think like people acting like they're strange and all the rules don't apply to them and they can just do you know i just have a different personal space issue than you do oh that's just it is it's just an arbitrary personal space problem or something you know i think that that's often a sign that something's up you know Mm -hmm. don't just think hey you're weird and that interesting i'd think oh no time out you know, <laughs> that'd be yeah. one of my warning signs. Okay. She's the one. I really like this lady. I also consider it kind of tragic that she wrote all those letters anonymously. And I think also overall, there just were no methods in the church to deal with this. Mm-hmm. You know, that even the people who received these letters didn't have like a process or an investigator or a like, like the only process that appeared to be in place was that if you were anonymously accused of something, you would tell the person who was accused that they'd been anonymously accused. That's the yeah, only which... process mentioned, you know? <laughs> right. And I mean, this is a big oversight in the church. I hope it's been fully addressed at this point. Yeah. And not obviously this is not an excuse or whatever, but it. I, I think there was a different awareness of sexual abuse at the time, you know? And I, the mother, mother one says this, like she didn't have the language to describe what was going on. She didn't know how to put it. She tried to make it clear that there was something inappropriate going on, but she like literally did not have the words to say, you know, (laughs) I think this man is a sexual predator. And (laughs) right. Part of the education campaign in the church now to like, as a response to all these problems has been to give us more language and have you like Mm -hmm. watch videos and talk about grooming You know, Mm -hmm. like Mm -hmm. she wouldn't have had that word to use because that's what sounds like what he was doing, you know. Um, Anyway, so, all right. Now let's go into the next phase of these accusations. So then the church in multiple offices starts getting anonymous letters that are written in all caps. Yeah. (laughs) I think they were typed. (laughs) And they also kept making the point that they didn't have normal stamps on them. They were like uh, machine stamped. Yeah. Um, which is kind of interesting in the nineties. If you were going to make a movie with like a troubling villain or something, he would have written 
these. Oh, like, there's something letters. about these letters that seem a little bit crazy, but they also yeah. seem truthful. You know what I yeah. mean? Like, mm -hmm. it's like, just because you're crazy doesn't mean you're also not truthful. They also seem to have been written by a Catholic who is a believing Catholic. Mm -hmm. um, but they're in all caps. He, the person's very mad, as they probably should be. Um, they were not diplomatic at all, but they were just disturbing letters. It was kind of like, almost like ransom notes, right? And the the letters I noticed use the word um, a febophile, which is one of those clinical words to like distinguish that this is like a post-pubescent attraction, which mm -hmm. I just thought it was interesting that they have that word. Mm -hmm. You know, sense of some education. It's not like you can mm -hmm. just internet search in the early 90s. There was no internet then right. to speak of. So these letters showed a fair amount of knowledge, right? Yeah. Like they showed that he's got multiple families. He's doing these events. There's many victims. They're all of this age group. They're blah, 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 blah. And that makes me think that this person was abused by him and is one of the victims and had talked to other victims or this person was like a therapist or something like mm -hmm. that who'd worked with multiple mm -hmm. victims, whoever you are, God bless you. I'm sorry, I'm not trying to out your identity or anything like that, but it just seems like the person knew stuff that you couldn't know by rumor or, or knew stuff that you couldn't have known without a proper investigation. And that person, no one really had the rights to do a proper investigation and to interview everyone and things like that. So the person must've had firsthand experience, mm -hmm. you know, either as a victim mm -hmm. or someone who works with victims. And the letters were clear they didn't want money. And they were, this is the very early 90s. I think the letters stopped around 93. And they were pretty easy for McCarrick to uh, dispel. He was able to say, look, these are, um, you can't even confront someone who's anonymous. Uh, these are just coming out of nowhere and they're just slandering me and things like this. And he was writing letters to the clerics who received these, because these the clerics who received these letters would be like, "Hey, uh, Bishop McCarrick, here is the accusation letter we got. I hope you're doing well. You know, I mean, they mm -hmm. put a cover letter on it, send him the send him a copy of the letter, and send it to him. Right? That mm -hmm. was like the courtesy they would do for anonymous accusations. McCarrick would reply and say, "Look, someone's trying to destroy me. Blah blah blah. I got a hater." You know? Yeah. And he, he would um, it seems like he had a sort of tactic of saying like, oh, let's bring this all into the light. Let's talk about this. You know, you'll believe me more because I'm not being cagey, you know. So right. he, and he the would... other side is anonymous. Therefore, they are cagey. Yeah. Et cetera. Right. This happened multiple times. I, I would say over the whole thing, it wasn't just this one all caps kind of crazy letter writer. There was also a guy named Father Joseph Whelan who we think is a pseudonym. And then the last letter that seems kind of relevant, there's a guy named Richard Sipe, who um, is some type of psychotherapist and also was a member of a religious order. And he wrote a letter online that was basically like, this is an open letter to the church. And by the way, you know, it's the problem of church sex abuse is not a problem of a few people sneaking in. It's a problem that goes up into the hierarchy where people can get protected by other abusers. It's a network problem, not just a few bad egg problem. He then points to McCarrick and just is like, oh, eight. He's just like saying, look, this is all we know about this guy. And you guys aren't handling this. And he's one of the guys who is way up mm -hmm. in the hierarchy, you know. Mm -hmm. And then he mentioned a couple other people both of which I think were dead by the time you mentioned him. So his proof was like three people, one of which was still active, which is McCarrick. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. he might've been retired by then or recently retired, yeah. but he, even when he were retired, he was very active up until he got sent to Siberia, which <laughs> he, for people who don't know, he got sent to Western Kansas, Victoria, Kansas, which is this very small town. And he got sent to kind of live with some Capuchin friars and kind of in like timeout. You know, while yeah. the church sorted out what's going to happen to him, which I think is perfect because if you're from New Jersey and New York City, yeah, Victoria, that's... Kansas is Siberia, <laughs> and I love it. And the people of Victoria were not that happy about it. They were like, right, what? Right. <laughs> but I kind of liked it. I kind of thought, I even drove by, I even visited Victoria because I was driving to Colorado and stopped and because they have a big cathedral there I went to go see. They call it the Cathedral of the Plains. So yeah. I went to see that and I, I'm like, I know McCarrick's in that building somewhere. Mm. He's in timeout. So I don't mean to laugh at that to make light of any of this. But all right. So then the other thing that happened was in 2017, when the Vatican's like, we're dealing with this head on, even though he's very old and frail, we're just going to, we're sending him to Victoria and we're going to really handle it. Then people really started coming forward. And one guy who was a minor 
um, from the 70s said he was touched by McCarrick. Just, and then they had 17 other accusers come forward, um, who I think were mostly minors, mm-hmm. and most of them appear to have claimed touching. But the report says they're protecting the identities of these people, and there was all types of levels of abuse, not just touching, right. you know. And but all that is like real recent news. Mm -hmm. You know, and those people, I think I don't blame those people for remaining quiet, partly because I just don't want to blame victims. But I also don't blame it because it's like there just wasn't much hope for success. You know, there there wasn't a system to complain to Mm -hmm. where you saw, oh, this makes sense. I'll get some justice. You know, Mm -hmm. Um, those systems weren't created until more recently. And even now, I wouldn't blame someone for not trusting those systems. You know, yeah, and even I think in that time, it's like you would tell your parent maybe and your parent would be like you stop that you know (laughs) like yeah you might not even have like familial support let alone church support we also need to say something that's very hard to nail down that's like child abuse has been thought of very has been evolving as a concept fast Mm -hmm. like there wasn't even the term child abuse until 1890 Mm -hmm. you know certainly children have been abused far longer than 1890 right and uh, and it was like the animal rights people who had to protect children at first because they were like, hey, we'll protect a animal. So we might as well protect this child, you know. Mm-hmm. And so it really grew in the national consciousness to start protecting children. And um, I even saw like a lot of people we serve in ministry, some were from the deep south. And it appeared that they had no social services to protect them. And um, they were African-American in the deep south. And it just appeared that a lot of stuff was went unchecked in that community that yeah. was pretty horrible, and there really wasn't like child and family services then to help them, maybe because they were a minority in the South, you know. But that's kind of old history. That's like 60s, 70s America, you know, yeah, segregation. But, but, days, uh, but. one uh, thing I heard, uh, like I, I think one of the first like uh, child abuse cases against the church was brought forward in the 80s um, in Louisiana, and uh, that lawyer was hired to defend the priest was shocked. He didn't know that kind of behavior existed. He couldn't believe a priest would do it and thought, surely there's no other cases like this, you know? So it, yeah. But I also wanted to say like in the, in the whole mass culture, it was evolving too. In that, like, I know I had a friend who was pretty badly abused, not by a priest, uh, in the eighties and it went to court twice and twice it appears that it was all admitted to and that they knew the guy mm. was guilty and things like that. The same guy abused the same person twice. Each time the guy did zero jail time. Wow. You know? Yeah. It, it's just like it was not getting bad sentencing. Like we right now are more severe on this than historically we were ever severe on this. I don't yeah. have a problem with us being severe on this, but it's helpful to kind of like if you want to understand a mindset from the 70s, you got to know they weren't handing out bad penalties for this. Stuff. Right. Yeah. 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 I, I, I think uh, <laughs> people still find um, the sentencing for sexual crimes unsatisfactory. Um, right. Right. They want <laughs> yeah. max. They want death penalty for it. Well, which... I, I don't know. I mean, people get like some years. I, I don't know. It, it does seem crazy to me in some cases, but clearly though, I, I have talked to victims though, who I think are broad minded and they do think these people need taken out of the population and completely yeah. removed. Oh, yeah. yeah. So yeah. I, I don't think they were into punishment. They were into completely shut these people down, you know, right, right, right. Um, for the safety of society. So, mm-hmm. all right. How about you uh, go into the seminarian abuse? Okay, sure. They have priest one, two, three, four, and five. Um, priest one through four most relevant. Um, but I'm gonna speak about them more generally and kind of talk about some of the patterns. And a lot of this happened while he was in the Metuchen um, diocese in New Jersey. Some patterns. A lot of guys would hear, oh, like you know, uh, McCarrick is so great. It's great you're a seminarian under him. And it seems like some people did have actually good experiences with him. But uh, it starts off talking about priest four, and priest four is looking forward to meeting him for the first time uh goes to the bishops whatever and has this like super creepy interaction with him where the seminarian had like a rash and McCarrick notices it and he's like oh let me see your rash and sort of lifts up his shirt and it's like weird and he's sort of talking about his like manly hairy chest and caressing the seminarian and so the seminarian's like super uncomfortable and 
he said that at that time he perce- he perceived that as like creepy but not sexual which i just think this is interesting because this comes up multiple times that, that you know McCarrick is like kind of rubbing his chest and stuff and he just thought it was creepy so then later he's invited to the beach house that's um in Seagirt and the diocese has this beach house that uh, McCarrick uses uh on the regular and is inviting seminarians to and he has like one experience there where everything is fine and then this apparently was like a thing that would regularly happen it's repeated in other you know, reports, um, they get to the beach house and McCarrick is assigning rooms and, it's, you know, you there, you there. Oh, no, I miscalculated number of guests, priest four <laughs> or whatever seminary, and you're going to come sleep with me in my room tonight because there's a large bed in there. And it seems that all the seminarians, like nobody likes this arrangement, <laughs> um, but they find it like the situation is such where they feel like they can't say no. So then there's multiple of the seminarians and priests describe like, so they're, you know, going to share a bed with him. He closes the door. There's discomfort because they have to change in front of them. He's like commenting or like, oh, you're going to sleep in pants. You know, it's, uh, it's hot. And then he would start with some kind of like, oh, your bishop is so tired you know, or my back hurts. Can you massage me? And it would kind of become weird and sexual. And for people who haven't met McCarrick, he's a very physically small person. Right. Yeah. He's not overpowering anybody. Yeah. He's definitely not intimidating you yeah. physically. Yeah. So it's like kind of an overpowering because of position and charisma, right? Like, I think if someone's very charismatic, you could be kind of like, oh, I don't want to make things weirder than they are. Or am I misreading this or whatever? And um, and guys are also like, he's the bishop. They're worried about making it through the seminary. So he's got this kind of psychological whatever on them. But they, they describe like wanting to get out, but feeling like they couldn't resist. And what's described is like explicit sexual behavior. So I'm not going to describe it in more detail than that. Right. Okay. Um, so but there is there is explicit sexual behavior that happens with a. And this a is not priest. one incident. This is. Yeah. I'm, I'm, this is a pattern. Of this is a pattern. House incidents. Yes. Right. He also has um, access to this like fishing resort that I think is where he took a lot of like the, um, you know, the family's kids. Um, and he also took some priests and seminarians to this resort. One priest describes uh, like they're on the way to this resort and they stay at a hotel overnight. And McCarrick is engaging in some kind of questionable behavior in the bed next to him and kind of says something like you're next. Um, so it was it was happening to more than one person and people knew that other people knew, you know, um, that it was happening. So one uh, problem is uh, some of these seminarians would come talk to like the guy in charge of the seminary or whatever, the vocations director, I, I don't know. And they describe him being very upset, being angry, um, saying he would take care of it, but like nothing ever comes of it. And later on, they say that, uh, you know, he was very worried about protecting the church, not just like protecting McCarrick within the church, but he thought this kind of scandal would hurt the faithful as well. Um, So he, from the report, seems to have extremely misguided good intentions, I think. Yeah, I think I think we have to say that throughout all this, people trying to protect the church hurt the church. Absolutely. Absolutely. Like, it's just like their motive to protect the church was Mm -hmm. backwards. Yeah, you know, absolutely. They would have protected yeah. the church by outing it, getting it out, and getting rid of people. Absolutely. Yeah. So he, anyway, he had kind of power over the seminarians, whether they would become priests or not. There's another um, guy that comes uh, from Brazil that he abuses, um, and that guy like was afraid of like immigration stuff going wrong. So he has these kind of different, you know, uh, ways he has kind of power over people, and also like something about his personality made people not be able to say no. Um, another place, so we got like the fishing place, there's the Seeger, the diocese beach house. I want to say he's got kind of these like places where he's got like special access to because people like him. And I think, I think there needs to be something where it's like, go ahead and like your prelate, but don't trust them. And I, I don't mean that in a bad way. Like, yeah, I just think we need to like hold people to high standards and not give people like, oh, he's bending the rules a little bit. Let him. Right. You right. know, even if you like the guy, you know, even if you don't think it's possible, it just doesn't matter. Don't 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 create these things. 
Right, exactly. Yeah, Even I think like so. Even like why the diocese owned a beach house is like, like you can justify it. Okay, priests need to have vacations. They like to go to the beach. Let's have a beach house. We'll save us money. Forget that. Pay your priests a little bit more. Let them go rent their own beach houses. Yeah. It's just not the business the diocese should be in. Yeah. And I, I guess like a lot of uh, religious orders have had beach houses on the, you know, East Coast. Jersey Shore um, type thing. Yeah. Yeah. And Maryland, Delaware. Um, I don't really have problems with religious people going to the beach. I just think <laughs> the owning of the house was a, is, is a mistake. You know, yeah. so I think one of the things that comes away from this is I can think of three times in the report, including the seminary rector that you're talking about, including a bishop who saw McCarrick drunk and like doing something at the dinner table with another priest that like in public that was not right. You know what I mean? Like yeah. fondling him, you know, there was some other person who was trying to bring to light all the seminarian abuse but didn't know that they could get names and they were trying to write a letter to turn in McCarrick. I can't remember what the exact situation was there. But what, I, what I'm what i pointing out there is there were people outraged. Yeah. It wasn't mm-hmm. just everyone turning a blind eye. There were people mm-hmm. outraged who I think honestly wished there was a mechanism to prosecute this. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And would have taken that mechanism. Like they were motivated enough that it appears they would have take an action if there was action to be taken. But I think they just kept hitting the wall of like, I'm just yeah. getting shut down and I can't, yeah. I mean, I'm just going to be hurting myself and not, not even solving this problem. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yep. Another interesting thing that came, um, one of the priest's allegations were dismissed because they decided he was like an unreliable accuser because he had abused two boys. Right. And this is interesting. So he came forward and says to the bishop like I, I i got involved with these two boys and i feel horrible about it and you know he he's coming forward himself like right. you know this is a problem i did this it's a problem and in this conversation comes up that he had been abused by mccarrick you know and so he gets sent away to like receive some psychological help and some therapy and um the which um, i want to i want to point out there that one of the things that's weird that's hard for us to understand right now is they weren't giving therapy just for victims. They were giving therapy for abusers. Like there was a belief, a, a, apparently a professional belief in the 80s, mm-hmm. 70s, 80s, 90s, mm-hmm. that this was a treatable situation, mm-hmm. that yeah. you could send a priest away, have him treated, and then he'd be cool. You know what I mean? Yeah. You could put him back in ministry. But this is this is even weirder, I think. Okay. Um, the, the therapist... We're coming away from meeting with this guy saying, like, he's not he's not the victimizer. He's the victim. And it's like he literally admitted to victimizing. Right. Two minors. Right. And they're saying, like, no, he's been victimized, you know, and that that is just like so weird. <laughs> it is weird. And I think it's like a separate weirdness than the like, like, I feel like the church should have had a more common sense than all this. Mm-hmm. Like there's just no excuse for the way the church mm-hmm. was both structured, wax structure, and didn't know how to like call this out, right? There's also this other thing happening where it's like the psychological community also seems to have been evolving and been kind of confused. Yeah, right. You know, um, and and it would have been seen as like more cutting edge to rely on psychologists, right? And so the church, like you said, should have had better sense uh, than they did. Um, but uh, maybe in some cases we're trying to do the thing that was like of the day, you know, I, I don't know. I think we're getting ready to blur the lines between what we want to cover in our next podcast. What I wanted to kind of say, kind of throw out here, though, is that it's interesting how many people said it was creepy, but not sexual. Yeah. You know, which could be play acting, could be that it's so hard for someone who doesn't have that temptation to understand Understand. it as sexual, you know, yeah, could be what grooming actually is. It could be any of these things, you know, but it's something to Mm -hmm. keep in mind, you know, when you're looking out for vulnerable people and abusers and things like this. But another thing is, um, which I do think is partly our role as laity at this point is to be on the lookout. Mm -hmm. The other thing is that I wonder about is like, I have a friend in the intelligence community who told me that blackmail is actually very big business. And I also 
was kind of following cultural things in China for a while. And one of the things that happens in China is, and this could totally, this happens in the US too. I don't think it happens the way it happens in China, but Mm -hmm. this dynamic I think is cross-cultural. And the dynamic Mm -hmm. is that like leaders of like corporations in China would like go out and party Mm -hmm. and get super drunk and then do like really immoral stuff together. Like brothels and things like this right and it just doesn't make sense it's like if you wanted to go to a brothel why do you want to go to the brothel with your competitor yeah with yeah with your government contractor or whatever right it just doesn't make sense as a group activity yes but it appears that what it was was getting it was actually a social mechanism to give the goods like hey i can destroy your marriage you can destroy my marriage now we can trust each other because i've got the goods on you you know or i could bring you down you can bring me down now we got this mutually assured destruction Mm -hmm. essentially right and I wonder if there was some of that like going on in the higher up, like with McCarrick being such a high up in the church. I wonder if there was some, he might have had the goods on people, people had the goods on him. And that's why some people were quiet. Yeah. Like no one, what's interesting about this is it's all homosexually oriented. Like it's not, he's never victimizing a girl, right? But it's all predatory. Like nobody came forward and said, I was McCarrick's boyfriend and I was happy right, to be his right. boyfriend, you know? Um, yeah. like no one's talking like that. You know, everyone is definitely like, <laughs> I got put in bad spots. Yeah. Um, I didn't say something. So, but yeah. that doesn't necessarily mean those people aren't out there. You mean other people that he's got like the goods on, right? Yeah. Or a relationship with or something or had a relationship yeah. with who it was more not predatory, but oh, I definitely see. didn't yeah. make the report, you know? Right. Yeah. The only stuff that makes the report is, is stuff that is extremely predatory. And as it yeah. should, I guess I'm just trying to figure out the cultural, the culture you know, like, mm-hmm. like part of the reform of this is to change the culture at seminaries and things like that. And I just don't, there was a book written, I think by a guy named Michael Rose, that he said that the culture of the priesthood in the nineties and in the eighties was really negative. He claimed that there were like resorts in Mexico that like had times where only gay priests would come, you know? So that doesn't sound like sexual harassment. That just sounds like right. homosexual activity and being yeah. not chased, not yeah. keeping your vows yeah. and uh, things like that. But he was talking about things like that were just kind of open secrets. Yeah. You know, that was the ugliest podcast, <laughs> more ugliness to come. But now we're going to talk yeah. about on our next podcast, we'll talk about how the church handled these. Why did McCarrick keep becoming higher and higher from bishop to archbishop to cardinal? Mm-hmm. How the whole Vagano thing played out at the end. I'm curious about that. I haven't really studied that yet. Mm-hmm. And then we'll talk about Bishop Finn and my own diocese and Cardinal Whirl, who we knew also. Mm-hmm. And um, they're not in as serious a position as uh, McCarrick was, but they right. definitely were, it was definitely something that needs addressed. And um, that's it. And if you find this podcast helpful, I'm, I'm sorry that we're doing this, but I think it's a necessary thing to do. I also think it's necessary that we have someone talking about this who's not merely apologizing to victims and not merely raging against it. You know what I mean? And so I want to put this type of voice that we're trying to give this subject out there. That's why we thought it was important to do. But if you find it useful, please share it. Please tell people about the podcast. Please like it, whatever. We also want feedback. You can do it publicly on like a YouTube platform or just send us an email. So thank you very much. And Laura, I'll see you next week. All right. See you, Clark. All right. See you. Bye-bye.